Okay, let's get straight to the heat of the meat. I always enjoy when you we stand up there with your magic board on MSNBC and you break down the numbers and you break down the districts and then left-handed seniors who are <laughs> blonde are going to vote this way. Let's break down the midterms. Let's okay. Do it. Um, we're 40 days away, something like that, something, that ballpark? Yeah, we're five weeks. Five weeks? Yep. <laughs> so we're 35 days away. Um, people, uh, there's a lot of hope for some people that the Democrats will take the House. A long shot for the Senate. Which way is the momentum going right now? Yeah, I mean, the momentum is at a point now. If you're a Democrat, you're going to be severely uh, and I think justifiably disappointed if your party doesn't get back the House. Um, the districts, the combination they need, the factors, they seem to be there for Democrats. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is 23 seats. That's their magic number. They need to take back 23 Republican seats. There's about a dozen I think you could look at right now and say Democrats are reasonably well positioned in about halfway there. And then there's about two dozen after that. And I think you'd kind of put in that category of they could go either way. Just coin toss. But, yeah, if you, and if you just kind of get half of those, if you're a Democrat, you're right on the doorstep at that point, if not past it. And then there's a whole batch of districts past there that, you know, hey, if it's the kind of year they think it is, they're going to start getting lucky in those districts, too. I'm not saying this is something that's in the bag for them. Sure. They felt that way a couple of years ago, as you may remember. But this oh, is yeah, one I where, uh, you know, it's one where, look, uh, they've put everything they have into this. The opportunities there. Yeah, they could certainly blow it, but the opportunity. Where are the there. states where there's the biggest opportunity for Democrats to pick up seats? Yeah, California is the you know the granddaddy of them all. There are seven districts in California that Republicans hold right now, but that Donald Trump lost in 2016. So they voted for Hillary Clinton. They also voted for a Republican member of Congress in 2016. So that's the biggest single concentration uh, of targets for Democrats. When Barack Obama went back on the campaign trail a few weeks ago, first place he went, Southern California. Now, um, what, what's the chance now uh, for the Senate? 538 had the Senate at about, uh, about 33% yeah. that the Democrats could take the Senate. Has that changed at all? Yeah, that, that sounds about right, because what you have to think about with, uh, with the Senate is it's a two-seat net gain that Democrats need. They get the Senate, and that sounds very doable. Then you've got to think about this. There are 10 Senate seats that are up for re-election this year that are held by Democrats but the state went for Trump in 2016, Trump state Democrats. And some of these Democrats, you're talking about West Virginia. Trump won the state by 42 points. What? Democrats got to win re-election there this year. North Dakota, Trump won it by 36 points in 2016. Democrats got to find a way to win re-election there. Missouri, Indiana, 20 points, 20 points. So that's the hurdle for Democrats. It's the map on the Senate side. Well, uh, you have a new book. It's called Red, the Red and the Blue, the 90s and the birth of political tribalism. W what is it about the 90s that created the political tribalism? Is it Newt Gingrich? Because I always thought it's Newt Gingrich. <laughs> no, Newt seriously, he, he said... Newt changed the rules of politics. And what, how did he change that? Newt changed the rules of politics because he took a Republican Party in the House that was told when he got there in the late 70s, they were told, you're a permanent minority party. Democrats had controlled Congress for decades at that point. They controlled it well into the 1990s when Gingrich took it over. Gingrich told Republicans, you need to fight them every single day. You don't compromise with them. You don't give them half of what they want on taxes. You don't give them half of what they want on spending. You do contrast in definition. You define who you are, and then you contrast yourself with Democrats on the floor every day, every way. And he staged a series of almost like, I'd call them almost legislatively guerrilla attacks on the floor of the House to show Republicans what this was. And the most famous one, and Gingrich's rise, was the mid-1980s. Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House, Democrat from Massachusetts. He was in his early 70s at that point. And O'Neill baited him into a fight on the House, excuse me, Gingrich baited him into a fight on the House floor. Little three-term congressman from Georgia who'd been sort of a gadfly, that's how he'd been seen, Bates, the face of the Democratic Party, into a fight on the House floor, and O'Neill erupts and loses his temper, and he goes after Gingrich. And Gingrich, you just see the smile on his face. You can go look at the old C-SPAN archives and find this, because O'Neill's broken House rules. And a Republican stands up behind Gingrich, and he moves that the Speaker's words be taken down. That's something that's never happened to... It's a big deal in Congress. It's never happened to a Speaker of the House before. The parliamentarian, who's like a Democratic appointee, has to make a ruling rules against O'Neill. Mr. Speaker, your words are taken down. He takes his seat. Gingrich gets to keep talking. And when Gingrich finishes, this is an amazing moment of video, and I think a key moment in the turning point of American politics, Gingrich folds up his binder, walks up the aisle in the House. The entire Republican side stands and cheers. And he's given them a taste 
of what it feels like, that kind of politics. And I think that's the kind of politics that powered him, powered the Republican Party, and really is a huge part of the 1990s. And he also but then said to the Republicans, once he got into power, he said, you can't go play with the Democrats. Not, not only can you fight them, but you can't go talk with them. You can't go have lunch with them. You can't do anything with them, which led to... I've always understood the true destruction of any sense of bipartisanship in Washington because you can't be friends with these guys is uh, sort of the first step to we can't have a communicating government with each other. There can be no grease of civility. And, and it's amazing to, because when he came to power, 1995, Republicans take over the House, Newt Gingrich becomes the speaker. His mission at that point was not just to finish off Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was still the president. People thought he was very weakened. His mission, he thought, was to finish off the Democratic Party and modern liberalism. That's sort of the, you know, the LBJ, Great Society. And he picked a fight on Medicare, Medicare funding. And he basically challenged Bill Clinton, dared Bill Clinton to shut down the government over it. Clinton called his bluff on it. This is the government shutdown of 1995. Yes. Turned around the Clinton presidency. And it revealed this great contradiction in how sort of we as Americans, I think, approach politics. Conceptually, we love small government. Conceptually, we have a lot of conservati conservatism in us. Uh, but we like our Medicare. We like our Social Security. And that's that great that both parties have been trying to navigate that divide, I think, ever since. Well, um, the book is The Red and the Blue. The man is Steve Kornacki. They're both available now. We'll be right back. <laughs>